Lynn Dawson's story, it was tragic. It involved a loving mother painted as a runaway wife who would just willfully abandon her daughters. It was just absurd, and yet that was the story that was accepted on the Northern Beaches by the police at that time. Real Crime Profile is brought to you by many wonderful sponsors such as Zip Recruiter, Madison Reed Hair Color, Quip Toothbrush, and Man Crates. We are so thankful to have their support and so happy whenever they have a special offer just for our Real Crime Profile listeners. So please, when you hear one of these special opportunities to try a new fantastic service or product, do go over and check them out. We can't do our show without you, and we certainly cannot do it without the companies who make our show possible. You can find the most recent sponsor offer in our show notes, on our Facebook page, and on our website, realcrimeprofile.com. Thanks so much, and thanks for listening to Real Crime Profile. Hey there, it's Laura Riches from RCP with some really exciting news. You can now listen to new episodes of the show completely ad-free, exclusively on Stitcher Premium. In addition to our ad-free episodes, you can also listen to tons of other ad-free Wondery shows. Plus, with Stitcher Premium, you'll get access to hundreds of hours of original content, audio documentaries, and exclusive bonus episodes from some of your other favorite podcasts. You can sign up now for a free month of Stitcher Premium by going to stitcherpremium.com slash Wondery and using the promo code Wondery. Then once you're signed up, just download the Stitcher app for iOS or Android and start listening. That's stitcherpremium.com slash Wondery and promo code Wondery. It's very difficult to put into words the depth of grief you feel when a, a, a loved member of the family just drops out of your life. Mum didn't drive, so she'd take the train up to the central coast because that's where Chris had said that Lynn had run from. Next stop, Arawa. My mother never stopped searching for Lynn. We all were searching for Lynn. Hello and welcome to Real Crime Profile. This is Jim Clementi, retired FBI profiler, former New York City prosecutor and writer producer on CBS's Criminal Minds. And with me today is... Laura Richards, criminal behavioral analyst, former New Scotland Yard and founder of Paladin National Stalking Advocacy Service. And it's me, Lisa Zieg, casting director for CBS's Criminal Minds, where Jim Clementi is my colleague. Well, we're back and we're talking about Helena's police statement that was done just about a week after Chris gave a statement to the police, the first official statement that he gave months, it was about seven months after uh, Lynn disappeared off the face of the earth. So Laura, if you would continue to read segments of this and then we'll talk about it. But I think my, my initial observation just from the start is that she talks about how unhappy Lynn was, but also just the, the trouble that the teenage girl caused. And she seems to focus much of her angst and upset on the teenage girl, which of course we know is Joanne Curtis. And, and that may be due to the fact that she doesn't at this point really suspect Chris of any foul play. And so she's looking for the, third wheel and thinking that that is the issue. And I think that's very true, Jim, because Helena adored Chris Dawson. You know, at, at the start of, their, of her getting to know him, Chris Dawson could do no wrong. He, he didn't drink, he was fit, he was handsome, he was up, upstanding as a school teacher and formal football star. These are all things that Helena said and that she adored him and she trusted him. So she had no reason at the beginning um, because Lynn also wasn't sharing anything other than how upset she was because of Joanne being present. So I think from Helena's diaries and from her statement, we get much more of an insight about the transition for Helena of her realization that actually Chris Dawson was probably involved in Lynette's disappearance. What strikes me off the jump is right off the jump, as you say, Laura, she says right away what her daughter's state of mind is, and she mentions the babysitter. In his entire antecedent statement, he never mentions the babysitter. 
at all. It's just completely absent. It just it does not exist in his reality. Again, he's hiding a fact that he wouldn't have to hide if it wasn't for it being an indicator that he was actually involved. If he, if he wasn't involved, if the fact that Joanne was in the house as a babysitter was completely innocent, then why would he hide it? Why wouldn't he just admit to it? Or even just admit that they had arguments about her. Why, you know, why it's just, it's just, he's completely scrubbed it from her history. You know? Exactly. Joanne's not present at all, but she does list, you know, day by day. So she talks about December 22nd. She says, Chris left Lynn and the two children. She had expected him to pick her up after work and came home after waiting until 6 p.m. to find a goodbye note, in inverted commas, and in inverted commas, not to paint too black a picture of him to the children, close inverted commas, if I remember what Lynn told me correctly. He then came home on Boxing Day and followed two rather tense weeks, I understand, a visit to a psychologist January the 8th, which relaxed them somewhat. The baby was disturbed during the night and Lynn broke down, Mm. so Chris told me. She took herself into the bed in the study where I guess she stewed in her misery. Chris said he arose early, did a load of washing, cut lunches for them to take to the pool, was very, very calm, apologized for her breakdown and asked to be driven down to the bus stop at 7 a.m. to Chatswood. She was to come back in time to have lunch with them at the swimming pool. She was wearing shorts and carried three plastic shopping bags, saying she wanted to return some clothing at Chatswood and probably would go on to Paddy's Paddy's markets. I arrived at the pool at 2 p.m. to have a swim with them and was met by an agitated Chris wanting to know if Lynn had contacted me. At 3 p.m., he received a telephone call and came back to me on the seat, visibly affected. It was an STD call from Lynn saying she needed some time to think things out. Was on Central Coast with friends, no idea who that could have been, and was all right. That was January the 9th. And this is all according to Chris. The things that she's relating as for what happened the night before with the baby and all this and the morning, that's, she doesn't know that that really happened or not. No, but she does know there was an attempt for him to leave Mm -hmm. as well, um, that he was concerned about her painting a bad, a a black picture to the children. So there are, there's some narrative in there that Lynn did tell her um, about him trying to leave her. But of course, as you say, the rest of it is all Chris's narrative. But that narrative, that, that information came from the fact that didn't Lynn... Uh, and the girls uh, spend Christmas with her parents because Chris was gone. Didn't she, wasn't she broken down, uh, terribly hurt by the fact that he left? And the only thing he was concerned about was that she not tell the girls too much bad stuff about him. It's very instructive about, you know, what she was saying and what she wasn't saying. I mean, I think what Lynn was saying and what Lynn wasn't saying. I think that she only told her mother the the bare necessities because, you know, her mother loved Chris and, and truth be told, Lynn loved Chris and she didn't think that he was capable of doing something violent or, you know, wiping her off the face of the earth. And it's just very, very interesting that his statement hides the major fact that was creating a problem in their marriage. And that was that he was trying to leave Lynn for Joanna. Yes. The main thing about Joanne not even being present or acknowledged, it's the omission much more with, with him than anything else. And she, she then categorizes, you know, Sunday the 10th and talks through each day. So she says Sunday the 10th, Lynn contacted Chris again saying to let Barbara know she would be off, off a week owing to illness. Chris reminded her to ring me, and she said she would contact Chris and myself on Wednesday the 13th. Again, I, I find that quite interesting, you know, that he is saying to Helena, I told Lynn to call you, 
again, I'm, I'm trying to do the right thing, you know, trying to facilitate communication. I think that's an interesting detail. She then said in her statement, it says Sunday the 12th, she came back to the area and purchased an article on the bank card for $16. I guess a cardigan, as she had nothing with her. Although Chris said her uniform for nursing was not there, although, although her papers were. She's perpetuating some things that Chris must have told her, right? Right. And to the police, aren't they going to think that she's talking, that she knows this for sure? Right. She knows that she purchased something. And that this is the first time I noticed that, that he said that her nursing outfit was missing. That, although Chris said her uniform for nursing was not there, although her papers were. There's more on that. She says, Wednesday the 13th, I waited in all day for her call, which didn't eventuate. Chris's didn't either. Wednesday the 13th, Lynn had an appointment with Dr. King at DY, an eye specialist, to have new contact lenses fitted as she held a credit or $138 for them. She did not keep it, and I have recently cancelled the credit with OPSM. How cruel is that, you guys? That this guy tells his mother-in-law that her daughter, who she's desperate to see, is going to be calling. And he knows that this call is not going to come. And he doesn't even call her. I mean, what kind of a heart of ice do you have to have to put somebody through that? I mean... Well, certainly if you're capable of murdering your wife, the mother of your two baby girls just so your 16 or 17 year old girlfriend could move in and you won't lose the investment you have in your property. I think it takes a lot more coldness to do that. This is just totally consistent with that kind of behavior. Yeah. And then on Friday the 15th, Helena statement reads, I had a call from Chris around tea time saying he had had a call from Lynn. He couldn't recall if there had been pips, but he said she had been north and needed more time. He got annoyed with her and said, how much more bloody time do you need? He asked her not to hang up as she said she wouldn't come home if he spoke to her like that. Chris said to ring your mum. She said she would when she felt she could. He asked her to come home. He said we all needed her. She said I can't. That was the last time we had contact with her. All this conversation was relayed to me by Chris as soon as she had rung him. Yeah. Okay. So again, what we're getting here is hearsay and it's hearsay that's incredibly helpful to Chris. And it also puts the police off any need for an investigation. It keeps the focus of this missing person away from the home. And it makes it seem as though she is alive and well and deliberately away, which then, of course, is not a police matter. So it's expertly crafted to to have the result that actually happened. That is, there was no real police investigation at this time, and there wouldn't be one for decades, which is really sad. And I think if we go back to Lisa's question from the last episode about whether this is driven by just sort of a misogynistic view. In other words, the lack of any kind of value on the life of a young mother, Lynn Dawson, or whether it was something else. And like Chris's fame that that caused the police to not look into this. And I think it was sort of like they had blinders on because of Chris but they did not really consider how much it would actually take to rip a young mother away from her two beautiful daughters, two-year-old and four-year-old girls that she obviously cared tremendously about. And there's no indication on this planet at all, nothing, not a scintilla of evidence that she would have left them alone. And I think that, you know, where she says that was the last time we had contact with her. We. She believes it. She believes it. Yeah. She is totally hook, line, and sinker buying everything that Chris said. And it's sad because, unfortunately, what it did, this statement actually ends up supporting him in a very real way. And what it does is 
gives the police no reason why they would think that Lynn was actually uh, dead or had met foul play. Hiring can be pretty time consuming. You post a job to several online job boards only to get tons of the wrong resumes. Then you have to sort through all of those resumes just to find a few people with the right skills and experience. Those job sites that overwhelm you with the wrong resumes, they're not smart. And that's why you should do the smart thing and go to ziprecruiter.com slash real crime. Unlike other job sites, ZipRecruiter finds qualified candidates for you. Its powerful matching technology scans thousands of resumes to identify people with the right skills, education and experience and actively invites them to apply to your job so you get qualified candidates fast. It's no wonder that ZipRecruiter is rated number one by employers in the US. This rating comes from hiring sites on Trustpilot with thousands of reviews. And right now, our listeners can get ZipRecruiter for free at this exclusive web address, ziprecruiter.com slash real crime. And if you love this show, show your support to it and ZipRecruiter by going to ziprecruiter.com slash R-E-A-L-C-R-I-M-E. That's ziprecruiter.com slash real crime. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. You know, if it's true that the way to someone's heart is through their stomach, then boy, Man Crates has the perfect Valentine's Day gift for your special someone. Instead of sending your sweetie a bouquet of roses, you can send them, and I'm not kidding, a salami bouquet, which is such a fun and special gift. You get a box that looks just like they're getting a bouquet of roses, but instead of roses, there are these wonderful salamis from Columbus Craft Meats. You get five salami sticks, and they're each so delicious. You get Italian dry salami, a chorizo salami. My favorite is the sopressata salami with sweet fennel and chili pepper and they come on these sticks that make them look like roses. It is a wonderful gift for your special someone. But not just that, you can send someone a jerky heart, which is a heart-shaped box full of beef jerky. I mean, the possibilities are endless. Man Crates knows what guys like, and they have hundreds of gift options, so you know you'll find the perfect surprise for him. So give your special sweetie an unforgettable Valentine's gift this year. Plus, every Man Crates comes with a 100% satisfaction guarantee. Get him a Man Crate, plus one of their meaty Valentine gifts, and save. Just for Valentine's Day, get 14% off when you spend $100 or more at mancrates.com slash real crime. That's mancrates.com slash real crime. Certainly from my perspective, I believe that she was killed. It's our job to get to the bottom of the truth. And whilst we didn't do that three decades ago, I'm adamant we will do that in 2018. She does go on to say, and again, it buys into what he's telling her. She used the bank card again on the 26th to buy a pair of jeans. But that was the last time as the account used to go to the Warrywood Child Minding Center and they, they would notify Chris it was there. So this whole coming back to buy a cardigan and buying a pair of jeans... I mean, if you think about it logically, it makes no sense. Why would she buy, purchase just two items of clothing and come back from, you know, if she were on the coast with her friends to take time out, why would she risk being seen just to buy two items of clothing she could have bought anywhere? Right. And why wasn't she seen when she did that? And on top of that, were there not stores where she was? And if she was in a cult, did she really need to buy clothes now? And why those two items? My feeling is they were probably inexpensive items that Chris purchased either deliberately for Joanne or he did it as a forensic countermeasure so that he could point to that and say, oh, see, she's still alive. Here's the receipt. Only he never comes up with the receipt. We don't even know if that happened at all. There's no corroboration at this point that what he said about that, that statement was actually true. Right. And then, you know, some of the statement as, as it goes on is about her um, talking about the nurse's registration board. So she says, I've contacted the nurse's registration board in Sydney twice, but she's not currently registered. 
The Queensland Nurse Registration Board also has no one under the name of Sister Lynette Joy Dawson, Lynette Joy Sims or Lynette Joy Hewitt Sims, in which name she is trained at the Children's Hospital Camperdown. Chris said she was unable to find her white uniform at home. Over this period, I've rung many hospitals, also called at many hospitals, but I have learned she cannot work in them as far as I can ascertain unless she is registered. So she's chasing down oh, you know, yeah. hospitals, trying to find out whether she is still working right. anywhere else. She's doing else. some work, right. But what's interesting is sister. Now, I'm just assuming here that they call nurses sister because when I first heard that, um, that he said that, that this sister in his, in his uh, statement said something about some sister, it was not her. It was not Lynn Dawson. Um, I, I assumed that he was talking about a nun. Right, know, me too. Me convent. too. But apparently, based on what Helena just said, that that's probably the title they give to nurses, and it's an interesting cultural difference that that I didn't understand. But if our listeners could uh, either confirm or refute that, that would be really interesting to know. But obviously, Helena is actually doing the work that Chris claims to have done in his statement to the police. But as we have also stated, none of the people that he said he contacted actually corroborate that he reached out to them and tried to find out where Lynn was. But I'm pretty sure that when Helena makes these statements, these are things that she did to try to find her daughter Lynn because she actually did want to find Lynn. She actually did believe Chris's statements that Lynn was away. So because Helena thought that, she thought, well, Lynn must be working somewhere. She has to live. So this is a great way to find her. But what's interesting is that she's doing this basically on her own. And she's not doing this in conjunction with the police. So the police aren't taking this as a, as a case at all. They're literally treating it as if a wife decided to just walk away from her husband and, oh, by the way, her two-year-old and four-year-old daughter, which, which makes absolutely no sense, and every earthly possession that she had, and she didn't know how to drive, and she had no way of making money. It's just, it's just really unfortunate that, that somebody didn't just look at this at face value. You could tell that something stinks here, and they should have been able to put those pieces together that's right i mean she's very specific uh, as opposed to what we hear from chris dawson's statement you know she says i have written to senator bohm as she worked as his nurse when he was practicing and had a doctor's room in the in the medical center opposite i thought she may have approached him for a reference and i still want to hear from him if he isn't too busy End of April, May, I put an ad in the Manly Daily for a week as a lady whose child she minded in the center said she saw her standing in the Narrowena shopping center near a car. Barbara showed her a snapshot and she pointed Lynn out. Around about the same time or earlier, another friend of Lynn and Chris's thought she saw her in a car outside a fruit store she worked at on the way into Gosford. So I put an ad four times in the Central Coast paper. Mm. It's her birthday on September 25th, and I intend putting an ad in the paper then, and also SMH and telly in the hope of seeing her seeing it. She didn't drink or smoke. Her only vice, as such, was to wander through the shops and spend unwisely at times. Mm. And that's an interesting statement. Yeah, I wonder if that's also just the perpetuation of Chris's statement. Yeah. Whose narrative? Is it hers, or is it what he's been saying? Robinhood is an investing app that lets you buy and sell stocks, ETFs, options and cryptos all commission free. While other brokerages charge up to $10 for every trade, Robinhood doesn't charge any commission fees, so you can trade stocks and keep all of your profits. Plus, there is no account minimum deposit needed to get started, so you can start investing at any level. The simple intuitive design of Robinhood makes investing easy for newcomers and experts alike. 
View easy to understand charts and market data and place a trade in just four taps on your smartphone. You can also view stock collections such as 100 most popular. With Robinhood, you can learn how to invest in the market as you build your portfolio. Discover new stocks, track your favorite companies and get custom notifications for price movement so you never miss the right moment to invest. Robinhood is giving listeners of Real Crime Profile a free stock like Apple, Ford or Sprint to help you build your portfolio. Sign up at realcrime.robinhood.com. It is really sad, but it's also as her daughter, kind of beautiful to hear all these people coming forward and, he, you know, hearing how much she was loved. So even though I hear their heartbreak and I hear their regret and, you know, a lot of people wishing that they had been more assertive with nudging the police along or, you know, whatever. She, yeah, I, I think it's been such an unknown to me. It's like, all oh, these people really love my mum and keep saying what a beautiful person she was. So that's kind of beautiful to hear that. She says some, a couple of other points which I'll share with you. She loved her children, husband and home, family gatherings, going out as a family. First always to ring in on birthdays, but my birthday, February the 1st, Mother's Day, her little girl's birthdays, July 9th and 11th, all pass. No contact made. It is so totally out of character. Mm. The manager rest to the WCM centre said Lynn had a very high sense of responsibility in her work. And then she says, I've registered with the Salvation Army, MPB. They have had an ad in the war cry on July 24th and no results. I have phoned taxation people, the social security people, and they tell you they can give, you, they can give no info out at all. She did not drive a car. Until recently, I have held my son-in-law in high esteem and got along well with him, but my faith has been shaken when for all his talk of wanting only to look after his two little girls, Lynn goes, in inverted commas, and he has introduced the teenager back into the home as early as February the 6th that I heard of it. So if Lynn has been in the vicinity and seen them so often together, she has cut herself off from us totally and completely, and I'm sure she can't be thinking straight. That's interesting. That yeah, I mean, she's really buying this hook, line, and sinker. And it's really sad because what it does is reinforces what Chris has been saying to the police. And, and that obviously undermines any attempt at creating a case. I mean, they have nothing to investigate. Well, that and then her diary entries. But how she finishes this is, so if... Uh, so she has a sister living at Stewart's Point. She has a brother living at Singleton. She has a brother living in Aberdeen. No one has had any contact with her, not she with them, and all are understandably worried for her and her two little girls. I've written things, I've written this as things have come across to me. It is the best that I can do. Sincerely, Helena Sims. And then the last bit, she says, March 15, I discovered a sister LJ Sims was working at Emergency 5 R-N-S-H, and Chris went to see her but was off duty. He described Lynn to a doctor he knew, but it was not her. I rang the next day and spoke to the sister who said she didn't have a sister, Patricia. I checked out a nurse Dawson at Manly Vale Private Hospital and a nurse Dawson at Brisbane Waters Private Hospital with no luck. And, and that's how it ends, of her obviously still proactively trying to find out if Lynn is working anywhere else. But her diary entries also give a, a, a very different context to what she's observing between Lynn and Chris and then Lynn's interactions with her. But I believe those diary entries, and we should go through them in, in our next episode, uh, weren't available to the police at the same time as, as the statement. I, I just, I find this really, really disturbing because unfortunately and unwittingly, um, this has helped Chris immeasurably. Um, and I believe that because Helena was a good person and she trusted others and she certainly trusted Chris, that she believed this to be true. It's just incredibly frustrating that she took him at his word because all it did is help him get away with murder, it looks like. 
you know, this was a trusting family. And for all intents and purposes, the exterior of Chris Dawson looked like one thing. But of course, behind closed doors, there was a very different situation. Right. But I, I'm not blaming Helena at all. I, I know she was trying to figure out why her daughter was gone. And it was the furthest thing from her mind that her son-in-law could have killed her. And it's just you know, she thought of Joanne as being, uh, you know, a young teen in distress and that, that Chris wanted to help her out and didn't see any nefarious intent behind that. Um, I think today, with what we know, um, if she had known those details, she may have acted very differently. And we have to remember how the way that he was construing his situation to others was that he was the abandoned victim, the husband who had been left with the two children. His interaction with Helena, who adored him, you know, he was the one that in a sense had been wronged. But in Helena's statement, you can hear his voice, him sowing these seeds, like the spending unwisely and things that he probably would have been saying in terms of his narrative. So some things do support what he's saying, but the absence of Joanne being mentioned, and then with the diary information that, that shows very clearly that the interactions that they were having, Helena was very concerned about. You can almost hear him trying to get Helena on his side to make her angry at Lynn when he recounts the phone call he allegedly had with her. Like, you know, how much more time do you need? You know, we need you back here. And, and, you know, he, he's just trying to, he's trying to play the victim. Yeah. Well, he does it so well. He does. I'm and sure I, I think doing that right now too. I yeah. think that pa the, one of the penultimate paragraphs where she says she did not drive a car until recently I have held my son-in-law in high esteem and got along with him well, but my faith has been shaken. You yeah, know? but even so, even though her faith has been shaken, her statement ends up just literally parroting chapter and verse about what Chris said happened. And it's unfortunate because if she had actually scratched below the surface and realized what was going on with Joanne and what was going on with Chris's twin brother and what was going on between Chris and Lynn, that she probably wouldn't have helped him as much as she did. And again, I'm saying this is inadvertent. It's, it was not deliberate and it was certainly not knowingly, but it is really, really unfortunate. Well, it's the perfect storm, isn't it? That we talk about, you know, and a number of things. It's not just one thing on its own that played to his hand, but of course circumstances are different now. So perhaps, you know, in our next episode, we we'll go through the other side to Helena's account, which are the diary entries um, that, that reveal some very different things that were going on. And of course, if any of our listeners have any information, these are still live and ongoing investigations. So we continue to have the Crime Stoppers number in our show notes. So please do, if you have information, um, share it with Crime Stoppers in Australia. And I'm so glad that the family is listening to our coverage of this. It's kind of incredible to, to think about them being, you know, on the other side of the world and, and hearing your analysis of this, of this case. Well, I, you know, this is why we're doing it. I mean, we're glad that they're listening, but we're also glad that we're perking up ears around the world about this case because Lynn's case is a terrible tragedy. And I can guarantee you there are dozens or hundreds or thousands of cases similar to this, not just in Australia, but in the United States and the United Kingdom, all over Europe, Asia, Africa, this goes on all the time because of social norms because people don't want to think bad things about people who are famous. I mean, we've seen yeah. many, many examples of how famous people, popular people can get away with so many crimes for so long, simply because of their stature in the community. And 
we need to stop letting that happen. I mean, you know, there's Sandusky, there's Nasser, and there's literally thousands more that are doing things that have been alleged to have been done by Chris and his twin brother. And I think that that kind of thing, I know that there's no place for that in this world. And hopefully our podcast and the swelling of support that we are helping to get for the Teacher's Pet podcast and for the case for justice for Lynn Dawson, hopefully it's making a little bit of a difference. A small bit of a difference. And as we know, we have so many cases queuing. So yeah. that also is a testament, you know, to the real world, what's truly going on out there. And we have to shine a light on it. So on that note, if you do have information about Lynn Dawson's disappearance or the historical sexual offences at the Sydney High Schools, please call Crime Stoppers on one eight zero zero three 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 zero zero zero, And we'll include more information about coercive control and where you can get help in our show notes. Okay. So we still have a lot, 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 lot more to talk about. We really do. We really do. And we've really got to cover Joanne's victimology as well. There's so much, you know, traffic and conversation about Joanne. And she's such an important part to the jigsaw here in terms of, you know, what she saw, what she understood, and the fact that she was groomed and manipulated. And we really have to challenge some of the language and the conversations that are going on right now and help people understand and, and educate and raise awareness about abuse. Absolutely. All right. Well, till next time, when we continue our coverage on the Teacher's Pet podcast, we thank you for listening to Real Crime Profile. If you like our podcasts, there are a few things you can do. You can take two minutes and go to Apple Podcasts and leave a five-star review. You can also check out all Real Crime Profile offers and promotions and our sponsors in our show notes. Another thing you can do is go to Facebook and like our Facebook page, and you can also follow us on Twitter at Real Crime Profile without the E. And one last thing, please tell your friends, family and colleagues about us and spread the Real Crime Profile word. Thank you so much for listening. We really appreciate all of our listeners. Real Crime Profile is produced and edited by Paul Francis Sullivan. Sound engineering by Mike Thal. Music is composed by Simba Tsumba. Logo art by Jim Clementi. Real Crime Profile is produced by XG Productions and distributed by Wondery. For advice and support if you're experiencing stalking in the UK, you can contact Paladin National Stalking Advocacy Service on 0203 866 4107 or you can go to the website where there's a lot of information and advice that you can follow on www.paladinservice.co.uk. If you're experiencing domestic abuse, you can call the National Domestic Violence Helpline for free on 0800 200 247. In the US, if you're experiencing domestic abuse and need advice, shelter or counselling, you can call Genesis, the 24-hour hotline, on 214 946 4357. You can also go to their website for further advice or support, www.genesisshelter.org. And there's the Domestic Violence Hotline on 800-799-7233.